Okay, uh, it is a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, David Beltran uh, from the University of Valencia. Uh, David is an old friend and collaborator, uh, and today he's going to talk about uh, endpoint sparse domination for oscillatory Fourier multipliers. Thank you, David. Thank, thank you, Jose, for, for the invitation and for the, for the opportunity to, to give this talk, and thank you uh, to everyone for joining. Um, so um, what I'm going to report is doing work with uh, Joris Roos uh, from the University of Massachusetts Lowell and also Andrea Seeger from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And, um, and as Jose mentioned, it will be um, some recent work regarding endpoint spar domination uh, for, for oscillatory Fourier multipliers. Um, so let, let me start by, um, by recalling what is the concept of spar domination. So given an operator T, and two functions compactly supported, it will be an inequality of the following type. We are pairing here, this inner product means the integral, we are integrating the operator acting on F1 uh, against a function um, that I'm gonna call F2, and we want to bound this in absolute value by the following very nicely behaved right-hand side. Uh, here, I am just taking averages, averages in with respect to two level exponents, P for the first function, Q prime, and you'll see later why I'm choosing Q prime here for the second function, and I'm taking averages over cubes. Um, those cubes, uh, I'm multiplying this against the measure of the cube, and, and I take uh, a sum over, over cubes that are not, they, they behave, they are from a nice family. So essentially, we can think they are disjoint. Well, they are, they are not quite disjoint, but, uh, but they are what is called uh, a sparse family of uh, the cubes, which tells which tells us that there are portions of those cubes, there are subsets, which I'm gonna call EQ, and those EQ, they are the ones that are pairwise disjoint. And those EQ, they are comparable in size to the original cube. So this gamma is a parameter that tells us how much proportion of our original cube um, that this subset EQ has. So for all intents and purposes, we can think they are, they are disjoint. This is what matters for the applications. So um, this, this concept of sparse domination is gained uh, relevance in the late 2000s um, with fundamental work of Andre Lerner, uh, who, who used it to, to give an, an alternative and simplified proof for the A2 theorem for calderon simon operators. Um, his original uh, concept of sparse domination, it wasn't the one I introduced here. It was in Banach space norm, uh, which was later refined to a pointwise inequality by Conde Alonso and, and Guillermo Rey, and also by Andre Lerner and, and Natarov simultaneously. Um, but um, this point was concept was stronger. It makes a lot of sense for calderon zimmer operators, but uh, uh, it has some limitations. And, and here, therefore, what I'm gonna use is the bilinear formulation uh, introduced by, by Bernico, Frey, and Peter Michel, and Kuliuk, Di Plinio, no in independent works. So this is the bilinear formulation that I'll be referring to. And um, one, one possible way to look at uh, the spar domination is that it is a modern measure of size. And let me explain what I mean by this. So let's assume that for these two level exponents, P and Q prime, the following um, bilinear uh, form of spar domination inequality holds. And uh, for a second, let's try to, to compute the LR norm um, of the operator T. Um, so um, by, by, by duality, I can just pair this with a, with a function F2, uh, which is normalized in LR prime norm. And therefore, this is looking like the left-hand side of my inequality. I can therefore apply my sparse bound to, to this quantity. And, uh, and now I can take this measure of the cube and replace it by its comparable measure EQ, where EQ is a subset that they are pairwise disjoint. And now for every point in this in this set EQ, then these averages, they are controlled by the hardy little boot maximal function applied to these averages for any point in the EQ. So I can replace this by the integral of the maximal function applied to the functions F1 to the power P and F2 to the power Q prime. Um, and now I still have a sum that I need to deal with, but now I can sum the I can sum all over the domain, so this is a positive function, and, and my EQ, they are, they are all pre-wise joint. So there is no problem in summing and getting here the integral over the whole army. 
And at that point, one can apply Helder's inequality and then to go to LR and LR prime and use the bounded net of the Hasley table maximal function of well, or this like the conjugate power of it um, to, to go to the L, um, R no, LR norm of the F1 and LR prime norm of the F2. So um, overall, we have seen that this implies that the operator T is bounded on LR whenever R is between, strictly between P and Q. And that's the reason why I use Q prime here. Okay, so a similar, a similar argument actually, it, does not, it doesn't just give this uh, LR boundedness in the intermediate regime, but it also gives us a, a weak type boundedness on one endpoint and a restricted a strong type boundedness on the other endpoint. And, um, and furthermore, under certain, circumstances, under certain situations, one can consider a, a local version of my operator and also get that the, the local operator at a scale one is bounded from LP to LQ. And, but what's more and more importantly is that as part of domination inequality like that, it implies the following weighted estimates in terms of Mackenhout weight and, and reverse Helder classes. Um, so here I'm not going to define the Mackenhout weight and reverse Helder classes, but, um, but the message that I want to send is that by uh, a more sophisticated, sophisticated argument than the one I presented in the previous slide, one can recover weight, one can obtain new and valuable weighted inequalities. And this is how this implies the A2 theorem for kind of single operators. So, um, so the way to really think about it is that um, uh, despite I motivated it by, by computing the LR norm, uh, the properties of that go beyond the proofs of the LR norm, they are going to be they are going to be used in order to prove this inequality. So, so really, um, we we are we let let assume that we know all the unweighted Lebesgue space bounds, and what we are really interested is in upgrading these to sparse bounds, and then use the sparse bounds to prove new weighted inequalities. So that's why I refer to uh, to it as a as a modern measure of size because it's a refinement of the usual uh, Lebesgue space bounds that can yield uh, several new consequences in, in a classical setup, okay? So that's the, the chain of implications that we should keep in mind. Um, and then with this diagram of a sparse bound that there are these two exponents, P and Q prime, uh, one can draw these exponents and, and the, the, the best possible sparse bound is one, one, the one here at this corner. And then beyond this diagonal, this diagonal mean, mean, means nothing because it doesn't, it means that the operator could be unbounded essentially. Okay, so if, only, if only a sparse bounds fall here. Um, so given given a point for a sparse bounds, observe that one can always go down and go to the left by just held the inequality because these are localized average and one can always push the P up, push the Q prime up, which in this language means push the one over P down and one over Q prime left, okay? So um, the the objects that I want to study sparse bounds for are the following oscillatory uh, Fourier multipliers, and and these multipliers are going to depend on, on two parameters a and b. So I'm going to consider them to be positive, and I'm going to uh, exclude the case a equal one because then um, that's the wave equation and better better bound hold. Um, so these these multipliers uh, which I'm going to denote by m a b. Uh, they they have this oscillatory term e to the i mod psi to the power a, and we are putting them in some sobel of space. Uh, we are dividing by psi to the b only for large frequencies. And this is what this chi infinity means. Um, and let me also then consider the so-called Pfefferman Fef and Stein or or Miyake classes. Uh, they they were this object were first considered by Fehrman at time, but then later on revisited by Miyake, and I'm going to denote by, by me, A, B, uh, that class of multipliers, which are um, essentially multipliers that they, they behave in some way similar to these ones. Um, they also depend on two parameters, and they are supported in large frequencies. Uh, but instead of giving this explicit form, I'm going to impose only that satisfies the following differential inequalities. So these differential inequalities are the ones satisfied by the MAB when we take derivatives. So that we, we differentiate instead of uh, the classical mickling hormone that it would be one, one gets like one extra, one extra one, one power. Uh, here we only get A minus one power every time that we differentiate in the side variable. 
So um, these objects for A equal to two are the Schrodinger propagators, so they are very natural objects to study. Um, it gives us the solution to the Schrodinger equation. And one can also consider other, uh, other powers of, of A. So they are classical. The LP bounds are well understood. They are LP bounded if and only if uh, the, the, the decay parameter uh, is at least greater or equal than A times the dimension, and then the, the classical one over P minus one over two factor. Um, so for P equal to two, note that we only require V equal zero because this is an infinity multiplier for V equal zero. And then we want to, to obtain what is the minimum smoothness that we need to impose uh, um, in order for have, in order to have LP boundedness for other values which are not which are not P equal to. Okay. Um, also LP LQ bounds are well understood. In this case, they depend on the um, they depend on the L infinity norm of the kernel. And let me here remark, I'm not going to go into details, but let me remark that the the LP bounds, the LP to LQ bounds, they differ. And they are not the same for the MAB than for a general Fourier multiplier in this class. And the reason is that having this oscillatory expression here, uh, when it comes to compute the, the L infinity norm of the kernel, allows us to exploit the stationary phase and obtain improved bounds for the MAB. So uh, the range of P's and Q's are going to be different. And of course, that's going to affect the corresponding sparse bounds. And, um, and away from the endpoint, and here by endpoint, I'm going to mean that the B, which is the decay parameter in this multiplier, is strictly greater than the threshold. Um, so that we, we can think that is this number plus epsilon, we, 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 we have um, a stronger condition, um, and we are away from the endpoint, then one can do just a single frequency analysis. So one could fix this just a frequency, psi to be at a certain two to the k. And, and I want to remark that when we look at a fixed frequency, that also corresponds to, to essentially looking at a fixed frequency for the kernel, that's going to be important. Um, then, um, because we are away from the endpoint, if we just try to look at the LP to LQ bounds for, for, this, uh, for, for the operator associated with this multiplier and that frequency, and denoting that by T sub M sub K, um, then this is just the scaling factor coming from the, the spatial scale and the, the, the one over P minus one over Q scaling. But more crucially, um, what we are obtaining is this X, this decay two to the minus K epsilon. We are obtaining this because of being strictly away from the endpoint. And therefore, once we obtain this decay, we can sum over all positive Ks uh, in order to obtain the, the, the desired LP to LQ bounds. So, um, so this incidentally also allows one to obtain P, Q prime sparse bounds for the very same regime of exponents P and Q. Um, and the reason is that fixing one frequency here means to fix the spatial scale that the kernel then is localized at this specific scale. And let me explain why, and this does not really depend on being a oscillatory Fourier multiplier. Uh, this is, oops, sorry, let me first maybe state the results, yeah. Um, so, so as I said, uh, this, the, the localization in the kernel plus this extra epsilon, they imply also these, these sparse bounds. Um, there are some error terms that one needs to deal with, and, and, but this is essentially contained in the following work with, uh, doing work with Laura Kladek uh, back in um, 2017, I guess. Um, and, um, and where we, we show that the sparse bounds hold in the interior of this region, and they fail outside the closure of this region, and then we left open what happens at the boundary. And this we could do by the single scale analysis. Well, we actually for the differential operators and had to deal with um, many error terms, but um, essentially the key of the proof is what I will discuss in the, the next slide. And, and then we revisit that for the specific form of, os of oscillatory uh, Fourier multipliers with the phase function, e to the i mod psi to the a, that they satisfy improved um, LP LQ bounds, one can one can turn this region into a triangle for, for those specific ones. And um, and, we'll, and we prove that with, with Juris Rosa and Andrea Seeger, uh, that we have bounds in the interior, they fail outside, and then open what happens here in the boundary. Okay. And these bounds in the interior, 
um, they they are they are a consequence of the following very easy spark bound that um, whenever we have that an operator is is local at the scale two to the j let's say um, and by local I mean that if I have a cube uh, that is of 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 size two to the j uh, side length two to the j then uh, and a function supported there making the operator act on that function, it doesn't really change the support. Maybe it just like uh, amplifies it by a dilate. Um, then uh, I could do the following argument. Um, if I also have an LP to LQ bound for my operator T with the, with the right scaling factor, because it's local at the scale to the J, then I can simply apply Helder's inequality whenever I'm pairing um, T applied to F1 with F2. And my function f1 is supported into a cube at the at the same scale. So then I can just paint it, uh, apply Helder, I go to LQ and LQ prime norm. Um, and the LQ prime norm of the f2 is fine. And that be that's gonna be my second exponent for, for sparse. And then this LQ, I apply the bound from that the operator has from LP to LQ. So I apply the bound and then I get like the, my function f1 and LP norm, and I get it on the, I get it like a localized LP norm because my, it was the operator applied to the function uh, F1, um, one over Q. And I also can keep the localization on the second function due to the local nature of the operator T because I can introduce for free a characteristic function of three times a cube here. So then I apply the norm, I apply the, the norm estimate and then the, my cube is at the scale to do the JD. So this factor, the scaling factor, I can use it to translate it into the, the measure of Q, then the average of the function F1 in LP norm and the average of the function F2 in LQ prime norm. Um, so therefore I can just break my function into the whole grid of all these joint dyadic cubes of side length to, to the J. They are disjoint the cues, therefore they are going to be sparse, and I apply the inequality to each one of the pieces, and then I get the following sparse bound. And here I'm tricking you because there's a Q and 3Q, but this can actually be arranged to, to be precisely Q and Q, uh, and this would give the sparse bound, these argument essentially modulo error, error bound, error, errors due to the tails and so on, will give you all the bounds in the interior of these regions that I showed. Okay. So um, the, the contribution that I want to present today is that in, in a recent uh, joint work with, with Rose and Seeger, we actually could prove the endpoint results. So these, um, these uh, we left open what happened at the boundary regions. So in the previous wars, we, we knew that it's, it's bonded inside, spark bonds hold inside, they fail outside, we don't know what happens at the Boundary. So now we do know what happened, and we have a positive answer for those for those sparse bounds. Okay, so that's the that's the main theorem. And uh, let me also let me also remark that our result uh, is a is a p greater than one sparse result. So um, so here I have this condition that the b is strictly less than a d over two, and whenever b is strictly less than this value, uh, if we remember what we have, that these are these guys are LP bounded when when B is precisely when the, when the regularity um, exponent is precisely AB times one over P minus one over two, then in this in this when, when B is really smaller than A D over two, then it means that P is really greater than one. Okay. And we'll use that P is really greater than one in our result. Um, so when we are in the in the other region, when we are uh, we have a lot more regularity, then um, then we are always on p equal to one, and then we only care then when p is less or equal than a, a over d, because if we are over a d a d plus epsilon, then this is like an L one kernel and all the wood bounds they hold. So uh, when when we hit the p equal to one, then this sparse region it would evolve into this kind of uh, into those, those trapezoids that they start to grow and grow and grow towards the whole triangle, upper triangle. And, and in that case, the single scale analysis from the previous papers, they were already giving some endpoint bounds here for p equal to one, but they were missing that corner and that corner and also this top edge of the trapezoid. Um, so our, our result what gives is that we, we close, 
we can get also this closure, but we are missing precisely that endpoint, that bullet point, which is open when P is equal to one. So, um, so a result is that P greater than one. So there are still a couple of open questions in this realm, which is to try to understand why why this is what can we say at that endpoint. Okay. Uh, and later on, it might, it might become a peer why why it is a P greater than one result. So, um, so the, pre, the what I commented on the bounds that happen in the interior. No, the the I go back. Uh, this bound happen in the interior. I said this follow from a single scale analysis. So then it becomes apparent that um, in order to obtain something at the endpoints at this boundary, we need to perform some multi scale analysis. So we should treat all the, uh, we should do some multi-scale. Let's, let's, let's be a bit ambiguous for now about what I mean by, by multi-scale. And, uh, and, and what is it known about multi-scale sparse domination principles? Well, a, lo a lot is known, right? Uh, not, only, not only this very easy sparse bound that I, that I presented um, in, the, in, the theory, in, in the theory of Calderon and Zimun and sparse domination for, for those objects. Uh, the argument is already a, a multi-scale uh, argument in a spatial type. Um, but, uh, but that's as much as uh, all this sparse theory has been pushed so far. So all the, all the sparse in machinery that, that uh, I know, um, up to now they are multi-scale arguments, but only multi-scale in a spatial type. They are kind of always single scale in frequency size. And here we, we don't only need a multi-scale in space, we, we need a multi-scale in frequency. Because we have a good sparse bound for a fixed frequency, and now we want to put all the frequencies together. So 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 we'll need to do something something different. So let me let me present as an example what I mean by this multi-scale in a space but single scale in frequency for which sparse bounds are known. So let's consider for instance 80 uh, a local average at scale T. It could be a ball average, it could be a, a, a spherical average or, or many or, or whatever, that doesn't matter. Uh, and, and then let's make it act on a function, which I'm going to denote fk. And fk is a function um, um, where, it, where it is acting a little bit daily projection at a scale 2 to the k on it. So it's a function for we, we, we only care about frequencies at a fixed scale. And, um, and let's take the, the supremum overall, overall possible overall possible time scales, or, or we can take it overall possible or, or maybe only lacunary. And that, that, that doesn't really matter for the argument. So, um, so here, this is different to the previous case where, where we had uh, one frequency scale and therefore we had one special scale. Now for these maximal functions, we have one frequency scale, but many special scales. So this is multi-scale in a space site. And for this, there are, there are sparse arguments. And in particular, in the context of spherical averages that are resolved by, by Michael Lacey, that was very, very influential. And, um, and which is based that on, on the fact that for a fixed frequency, we, if we have an inequality like this, that for a fixed frequency, we, are, we have an LP to LQ inequality with the right scaling factor here, depending on J, but has this extra decay in the frequency, then we are good. So we can translate this, this, this gain in, in frequency, we can translate it into some gain on a spatial side in a condition that looks like a calderon zygmunt type condition, and, and we are going to be good to some geometrically. So, so uh, again, this is, uh, having this epsilon will require to be away from endpoint. Um, um, and this is why endpoint sparse domination so far hasn't really been approached. Okay, um, so so this is uh, this doesn't apply as I was saying to to our original object because when we are fixing one frequency scale, we only have one scale for the kernel. Okay, and in here is the the the, the latest approach. Let's say is that we fix uh, one frequency here and we have many scales. So it's a situation that doesn't apply for us. What we want to put is the k together rather than the j together, where j would be this value. Okay. Um, nevertheless, let me let me also uh, um, comment on sparse domination for this type of objects, um, because in a, in in this spatial multi-scale setup, 
uh, that in, in a previous work with uh, with Rosen Seeger, we managed to extend Lysi's argument to quite a broad general setup, um, and so that the so that the sparse doesn't need to be proven for its operator in particular, but it can be obtained by uh, by checking some 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 hypothesis instead. Okay, so. This is uh, telling us that if we have a sum of multi of, uh, a multi-scale sum of single-scale objects, um, each object is going to be indexed by Tj, where J, the J means the, the scale at which the operator is local. And we have a weak type PP condition for these multi-scale sums, uh, which, was, which is a necessary condition uh, in view of what sparse PP implies. Um, then a restricted strong type condition, which again is necessary because of the discussion at the beginning of the talk. Uh, and then we have a single scale PQ um, for each one of the single pieces, uh, which, which again we saw it, it, it's kind of necessary in, in, some, in some sense. Um, and then we have this one, which is no longer necessary. This is sufficient. We have this epsilon regularity condition which is the one I presented in the, in the previous slide coming from this uh, single frequency gain with to the minus k epsilon. Under those circumstances, one can, prove, uh, one can prove a sparse bound. And I know this slide looks intimidating because there are many indices and so on, but, uh, but one shouldn't really be looking at what he's saying is that um, um, we have Banach space value functions that would increase applicability and, and, and then be able to obtain maximal function results. Uh, from from writing the operators as sums rather than soups. Okay, so so overall, this is a, a theorem that is telling us that um, is a quite an abstract theorem uh, under which identifying what are the hypotheses for the sparse domination to hold in situations where we are we only have one frequency going on but many spatial scales. And uh, and the proof of this theorem and in, in particular of many sparse results. Uh, it goes by induction on the number of scales. Um, so the number of scales going on into our, our multi-scale sum. So the case where there's only one term, uh, which is the base case, that has the, the single scale operator sparse bound that I presented earlier, uh, that one that follows from Helder and the LP to LQ bounds, that are our hypothesis. So this case is easy to handle. And then in, in order to handle in order to handle the induction step, um, we, we want to start adding one new scale, one new scale, spatial scale into our analysis. So um, in, this, in this situation, what is the, uh, the, the usual argument uh, exploited by, by many authors since the beginning, as I said, starting with work of Andre Lerner, is to use um, Calderon's Zygmunt decomposition, like an iterated version of Calderon's Zygmunt decomposition as it as in the case of the of the John Nirenberg inequality. So um, so let's just, let's consider a, a function which is supported in a, in a dyadic cube, and the dyadic cube uh, it's going to be of size matching the largest possible scale in our multi-scale sum, uh, and then one can therefore consider the following upper level sets uh, for the function f1. Uh, here there should be an fi. For the function f1, uh, we consider the in the the, the, the points where the maximal function is, is greater than the average, here a constant, and similar for the function F2. And one can do the Winnie decomposition of the union of these, uh, of these sets of omega 1 and omega 2, and perform then the Calderon the moon associated uh, to, those, to that family of cubes um, for each of the functions, where the D is a good function with the bond eternal infinity, and the Bs have are localized and have cancellations. This is a pretty standard argument in, in harmonic analysis. Um, and, and the key here is that one can use hardly little but maximal function theorem to, to control the size of the omega by, uh, by the size of the original, uh, original Q0. So therefore, one can, one can set E to be Q minus omega. And this means that the, the size of the EQ is going to be at least gamma times the size of this Q0, where Q0 is the original cube. So these E are going to be the subsets for sparse. So they are, a, they are a big subset of my original Q0. Um, and then, and they are outside omega. So omega will be a union of, of many Qs because I perform the Winnie decomposition. Omega is a union of this. Uh, so then they, these EQs are going to be disjoined than the, the, the upcoming EQs 
uh, that are going to be coming from this decomposition. So this will guarantee that the families that I'm constructing, they are parse families. Um, and, and once I carry on this decomposition, um, I, I try to make use of my induction hypothesis. So I try to match whenever I have a function f1 here, uh, localizing one of the cubes, I try to match this with, um, with the maximum scale here. And this can be treated by induction hypothesis. Then every time that a term with a put function, either g1 or g2 appears, I can, I can just appeal to the weak type PP or the strong type, uh, strong type QQ mapping properties to deal with the multi-scale terms. So here I don't need to, I don't, uh, I, I apply my multi-scale hypothesis uh, thanks to the flexibility of the L-infinity norm of these functions. And then the crux of the argument is going to be to obtain what happens when I'm testing my, my operator um, against a bad function here and another bad function here. And, um, and when the size of the of those cubes, they are small compared with the with the sizes involved for our operator, right? So here I have this multi-scale sum uh, acting on all cubes, which are smaller than the J's. So in order to obtain this bound, uh, I'm gonna skip details, but the key is to use this epsilon regularity condition to sum over all the scales of the cube, because that will give like a like a like a two to the minus epsilon. Uh, depending on the size of this queue with respect to this j and that's going to allow for some ability okay that's the key idea over this uh, where this hypothesis goes in okay so verifying this epsilon regularity condition what is forcing is to meet the endpoint um, when we are dealing for instance with the spherical maximal function that, that michael said it uh, or when we deal with oscillatory multipliers I mean, this condition is is uh, only satisfied when you're away from, from the endpoint. Um, um, so, so in the endpoint cases, uh, what we want is to, to replace that condition by some sort of multi-frequency techniques. So we don't want to just treat one frequency alone and then some trivially. What we want is to treat all frequencies together by doing something more sophisticated and try to still prove results. Okay? So, um, so this multi-scaling space is not enough. We want to do multi-scaling frequency for, for the objects. Um, so this is the main obstacle in general to attack endpoint sparse bounds. And when it actually comes to, to endpoint sparse bounds, the, the only known results that I know are really related to both and risk multipliers. Um, is this is resolved by, by Condalon, Stokuli, Di Plinio, uh, U, and also independently by, by Lerner. Uh, and then this one by Michael Lesik and Kessler. This is for P equal to one. This is for other pieces, but only a boundary segment and in two dimensions. Um, and that's the only endpoint sparse result where something is obtained at the boundary, which is beyond Calderon Simon theory. But, but Bogner Ries is not really representative um, because in Bogner Ries, all frequencies, they are only a single scale. They are all frequencies that are around this sphere. So um, they are all about one. So this is not very representative for, for what we are considering here, um, where remember we had any possible frequencies side to the to the k, and then we were only having one special scale uh, on x, um, or not representative for these other objects where we had a lacunary maximal function, where we had one fixed frequencies, but we had all possible frequencies on a special side. So uh, what we want is to, to, to treat this all together. And, and of course, if you, if you compare these two objects, these, these may be, they, they got to be easier uh, because here one frequency, it means only one special scale. So if I try to put all frequencies together here, I'm also putting a lot of special frequencies together, but there's still a one-to-one -one correspondence. In here, if I try to put all the frequencies together, one frequency has all the possible frequencies in all the possible scales in a space. So putting all of them together here, it will be to put all of them here, but all of them were possible here already. So it's like adding more and more and more spatial frequencies, right, for each one of them. So when trying to attack the endpoint sparse bounds, the, the first one uh, should be easier than dealing with these um, maximal functions associated to averages endpoint 
fast bounce for maximal fast transitivity to average this. So therefore, this is why um, we first consider this one as a as a third model case to, to hopefully in the future also consider um, these endpoint cases for these objects. So uh, this is the, the model of what I was saying. Multi-frequency for this should be simpler than uh, for lacunary maximum. Um, so um, so the, what we what we did in order to obtain uh, these um, these um, this is part of domination at the endpoint for those guys is to think about what more, what tools from multi-frequency uh, uh, analysis are, are are available or could be useful in this context. Okay, so so already in the in the in the case of LP of endpoint LP bounds for 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 the oscillatory Fourier multipliers, uh, one needs to do a a multi a multi-scale frequency analysis. And this is done by by doing an, by using H1 DMO techniques um, as a multi-frequency tool. Uh, this is the the original proof of Fefferman and Stein, where where the theory of hard disk spaces and DMO uh, techniques were were introduced uh, in, in harmonic analysis. So so then there are there are multi-frequency techniques uh, like this one. So our first idea was to try to use them uh, to to prove a spark one for this. Um, then but there is there's another multi-frequency technique, right? Which is using little Pupelli theory. Little Pupelli uh, is also many times useful to put uh, frequencies together. And and it, it turned out that um, that that's all we needed for for the spark bonds for these guys. And and the reason at the beginning we thought we would need this, right? Um, but but uh, but it turned out that little Pupelli was was enough. And here it play. A fundamental role that the cues that are involved in spark domination uh, they are always greater than two. So then there's going to be a, a crucial and delicate step inside the inside the argument uh, in which is uh, in which is this k means the the little Pupelli uh, projection at the scale k. Uh, we are able to do a Cauchy bars here. We need to detect when we are able to do that. Um, that's going to be inside the beast. You know, after one article, there was more decomposition and so on. So, um, so it's not like a, a, a step at the beginning, but rather in the details of the proof. Um, and at that point, um, one can apply Cauchy's bars inequality. And if the p um, and the q prime they are smaller than two, then we could use Minkowski to pass the literal to some inside. And then if we can pass a little to some inside, then 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 we have one already because we can apply little Pupelli theory. So that that's a little bit um, one of the key steps in the in the argument. So, um, but this of course relies on on Q being greater than two, which uh, which one is lucky and and here the the relevant the relevant uh, Qs they are always uh, greater than two. Or in in other words, this one over Q primes. They are uh, they are bigger than they are bigger than a half. Okay, in this in the pictures that I mentioned earlier that are represented for our theorem. But um, but are there any any instances where little bit of is is not enough, and then the the atomic decompositions of H1, the, the techniques from H1 or BMO, would actually play a role? And and the answer is yes. The answer is that um, there are there are there are instances in which this Q greater than two is not available, and one needs to do something more sophisticated. And let me present an example for it. Um, an example would be coming from from Bogner Ries, uh, from the BAM, from the BAMs associated to to Bogner Ries multiplier. And here I am just taking a delta. The, my multiplier is going to be a, a delta annulus around the sphere uh, of radius one. Okay, um, so these are the building blocks for for the Bogner Ries multiplier, um, concerned with the with the convergence of regularized um, um, ball averages, uh, convergence of Fourier series for regularized ball averages, um, and and then a, a version of the conjecture is is, um, is that when p is smaller than the exponent to the over d plus one, uh, then this is the precise dependent on on delta, where delta is the thickness of the of the annulus. Um, then we have finite net uh, uh, overall of this constant overall possible delta. Okay, so um, one can consider a multi-scale version in frequency. This is all concerned about frequencies where are high about one, right? We are always close to the average, 
and uh, close to the ball, uh, steer, sorry, <laughs> radius band with a delta thickness. But one can consider a multiscale version. How can I make all frequencies to appear here? So I'm going to be is uh, putting my frequencies at a scale two to the two to the two to the minus k, and then I I I take then a two to the minus k delta average associated um, delta two to the minus k neighborhood associated to to the frequency two to the minus k. Okay, so this allows us to put a multi-scale um, operator um, coming from these multi-scale bumps. And there's a there's a theorem uh, of Seeger in the early 90s that uh, is telling us that if we know the boundedness for a single bump um, at the critical index for 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 Bogner risk, then these upgrade to LP bounds for the multi-scale uh, version of the for these multi-scale sums of Bogner risk bumps um, when when P is really than the P node, where P node is the, the hypothesis on the boundaries of that. And we are writing this in a conjectural way because, of course, the Bogner risk uh, conjecture in dimensions three and higher is still unsolved. So this is why it makes sense to, to write it as a, as a conjecture depending on uh, on the best known results for, for, for Bogner risk. Okay, so uh, so we are able to prove an endpoint, an endpoint sparse version of the result uh, whenever we have sharp LP to LP bonds for single scale bands, whenever those are available, for instance, in the bilinear range. Okay, so in this case, the the this, the, the Q greater than two, which allow us to apply little Bupelli theory um, in the in the case of oscillatory multipliers, is, is no longer um, is, is no longer with us, right? Q is more than two uh, can also occur. So so then instead of little Bupelli, what we implement then is uh, atomic decompositions um, combined with the with the usual calderon zimmer decomposition in a sparse domination um, in a sparse domination argument. So so first I, I presented this uh, the proof of this spatial multi multi scale spatial result, which was based on iterating calderon zimmer decompositions. It was approved by induction at every in, in, the, in each induction step. Right, we apply calderon simon decomposition. So now we perform a atomic decomposition on top of the calderon simon decomposition uh, at each step. So and and actually uh, our results are are uh, here. I was giving two examples, but our results they what they what they are is results for for more general classes of of Fourier multipliers. Uh, the conditions here are quite technical, so I'm not going to go into discussing them. But uh, only the, the only message of the of this slide is to say that I presented two specific examples, but one can cover one can cover a, a more general theory uh, based on, on on conditions that uh, they they are natural because these despite they they look pretty uh, uh, over you know intimidating here in this slide they come from they come from things that are more natural like the mickling hormander multiplier condition and then like an an, an LP sensitive version. Of it, and then several in rewriting that into a into sort of some sort of like a a piece of formulation thing, and, and and well, I mean, I don't want to really go into those because 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 it's too technical. Um, but what I really uh, what I do want to um, want to to mention is um, is the is how to incorporate the how we incorporate the atomic decomposition. Argument in the in this part domination procedure because that's the uh, that's the main novelty of of the work really. So um, so in in order to to do this, one needs to do like quite a lot quite a lot of build up, and and the it's not is an atomic decomposition somehow adapted to LP, uh, kind of like trying to keep the structure of um, of the construction of the of H one but at a level of of, of LP. Uh, of course, HP and LP they are the same for P greater than one. But uh, here we want to kind of uh, not, not characterize LP by atoms, uh, but what we want is to keep the structure that could be useful in H1 techniques. So, um, so we need to do that also for because of the nature of the sparse bounds in quite a localized uh, in quite a localized setting. So, um, so we 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 do the usual construction of the of, of, of atoms associated to a square function, but the square function it, it needs to be dyadic. It needs to be in terms of the Martingale difference. 
Uh, and then when, when considering the square function, starting from an original cube is zero, and then we just uh, go down over all possible smaller dynamic scales. Uh, then the, the usual atomic construction is based on considering upper level sets uh, for this um, for this square function, uh, which of course is satisfied with bonds by the bonds from the square functions, uh, and then considering a family of of dynamic cubes. That these these upper level sets they get smaller and smaller, right? So we are gonna be uh, indexing by um, by R mu all the dyadic cubes uh, uh, containing a zero. That they they that the level the level mu um, sees still a big chunk of it, but the next level when it gets smaller, it does not see a big chunk anymore. And by big and small, I mean half of the proportion. Half of the mass of the of the dyadic cube. Okay, so so this gives me uh, this allows me to break dyadic cubes into this uh, union of families R mu, and to each of them uh, we can perform a Wigner decomposition to obtain the corresponding Wigner cubes, um, and uh, and then, and for for each dyadic cube I can also form the what I call the subatom. Um, but not what I call what people call the subatom, uh, which are functions that are constant at the scale uh, two to the two to the minus k, right? Um, if um, if we are we, we should be thinking in the usual, if a function in frequency is at the scale two to the k, then it is essentially constant at two to the minus k. So we are just um, stopping at at that scale. Okay, and and then then for each mu and for each of the Wigner cubes associated to this family, uh, to this parameter mu, then I can form the atoms where the atoms are going to be some of functions um, of, of, of the subatoms R, which are contained in the W, where they are constant in those R. Okay, these the R, they are precisely constant functions, and then I put together uh, a lot of, I put together a lot of uh, subatoms, which are my building blocks for the atoms A. Okay, and I also can define some coefficients for the atoms that I'm going to be defining in terms of the literal to norm of the constant functions ER. So with this, uh, with all this setup, with all this construction, which this is classical, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something which is uh, well known. Um, then we have uh, we have good control of the we have a normalization. That uh, uh, this might not be the the standard way to write it, but uh, in LP norm, the atoms they are bounded by by the coefficients times the measure. Uh, to the power one over one over p of my of my w's, and uh, and I can also do that for every fixed k. I can instead of doing it in instead of taking all the all the subatoms, all the subblocks which are of all possible scales, I can just fix the scale and consider uh, localized k versions for these atoms where all the all the subblocks involved they are all of the same scale and they they are they are going to be disjoint. So in this case uh, for fixed k. For fixed k, then um, I have a spatial orthogonality, so I can I can sum uh, when I consider the LP norm, the sums they go outside, and this can be summed in little l to norm to recover uh, to recover the original norm of my function, and of course this is only a statement of of little of little Bupelli theory. So I'm fixing k here, and I can sum in k in L2. So you should see in K is like the frequency, like the little Bupelli frequency, right? And then I have the little L2 norm, little L2 sum of that as the square function, right? So um, here I can, I can, this can be sum in little L2 to recover the, the, the LP norm of the function F. But uh, what the atomic decomposition is, is useful for is that if instead of just fixing the sum of the, of the, of the sub blocks, which is K, we also fix the sum of the atom. The, the size of the atom, so let's say the atom, the W is the one that contains many of the many of the R's. Uh, if we also fix it to be at the scale, let's say minus K plus N, um, then the advantage of doing that, of fixing this, is that this can also be summed in literal P norm as opposed to literal to norm, where P is smaller than two. So this gives an advantage that, uh, that um, we don't need to use something as, as strong as, as literal, with Pelly theory, we can get away with uh, summing in a weaker uh, little LP space. Okay, uh, and this is the key of the atomic decomposition. So somehow the examples that I presented, uh, the, the oscillatory Fourier multipliers or the multi-scale bumps or the general classes of multipliers that I that I skipped their definitions, 
they are well adapted to exploit these conditions. So, um, so in order to, uh, if I'm, if, of course, if I'm doing this, this localization uh, of, of the scale of the W, I still need to sum in N, right, to close my argument. But here, the, the key is that this data can sum in little LP. If I put in a, a little, if, if I put an error, LR norm here with R is really greater than P, uh, the same inequality holds with, with a good factor in decaying on N. And that's how one can sum all the ends and exploit perfectly the atomic decomposition. And this multiplier hypothesis that we that we pose, uh, then they can they can kill off the, the growth in K, um, but still get the advantage of the little group of the atomic decomposition. Sorry. So um, so this, all this build up, um, we need to do that before putting any in the induction step for the for the for the uh, for the sparse law. So remember the induction step, we did a Calderon Zimmel decomposition of the, uh, involving the function F1 and F2. So here we need to construct like a, like a replacement of the F1, uh, uh, which is this capital F, capital F. Um, which is is constructed from the atoms, okay, and then the the building the building block that we uh, so so and we use this capital F one coming from the atoms uh, in the Calderon Zimun procedure for sparse bounds um, instead of the F one, and this is what allows us to then use the benefit of the construction that we can access these scales. Uh, we can then make use of a little LP sum instead of a, a literal to sum. So then these Cauchy's bars that I did uh, to, to, to um, sum on K when the exponents Q were greater than two, now I could, I could do that with literal P and literal P prime, and then it can still work if, if, I, if I have constructed this atomic decomposition. So um, that's like a little bit the message of the proof that I, I wanted to send. So thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, David, for this very nice talk. Uh, is there any question or comment? If not, let me stop the recording uh, and we can turn the speaker again.